Um, right now, I just want to introduce myself and Esther, um, and then we're going to do a little opening and then get into um, the next hour and a half sharing uh, resources and tools with you guys. So, Buju and Dinaway Maganug. Hello, my relatives. Indigenous Gakadus Aki. My spirit name is Star Woman. My English name is Jackie Croshu. And I come from the Fish Clan, and I am enrolled in the Turtle Mountain Band in North Dakota. And it's right close to the uh, Canadian border there. So that is who I am. And Laura has some pictures. Um, thank you for sharing that. And I want to now introduce uh, my very dear friend and, and coworker, Esther. Thank you, Jackie. In Louis, Esther Ann, Chkwabanak Yig, Eskrumogadi Nil, Nuda Beg Zibayig, um, my name is Esther Ann. I am uh, Wabanaki, uh, the people of the place where the sun first looks our way. I am Passamaquoddy. My family's from Zibayag, which literally means on the edge. And I live here at the place of the White Rocks with the Penobscot people. And I'm happy to be here today. Really excited um, to get into it. I'm glad we have uh, such a good group too. I am too. So I think it's so imperative before we start these conversations, um, and especially with, you know, what is happening today with us, the pandemic, and you know, the, just just the the just life in general, you know, trying to navigate life on life's terms, right? So I just want to like set that intention for us before we get started, and and really, um, you know, uh, kind of make my my words my actions follow my words and and incorporating you know what we are saying works um and you know just want to honor you know you all for being here and and being with us and just taking this time out of your day i i recognize that um you know we are all extremely busy and but i but i guarantee you that some of what we have to share is um, quite beautiful and will really guide and nurture our spirit. So again, I want to welcome each and every one of you here. I just also want to share my gratitude to the Capacity Building Center for Tribes. You know, I was able to just witness the wonderful work and passion that, you know, we put into making this webinar um, successful and inclusive and, you know, also want to take a moment and recognize our, all of, you know, our sovereign nations out there, um, you know, the original keepers of the land we are on. Here in Minnesota, um, we have the Anishinaabe and the Dakota people. Um, but I've been doing this recently because I recognize that before we even get started, you know, I, I acknowledge that in Indian country, we have been facing some collective grief regarding the thousands of remains and burial sites of our children uh, who never came home from residential and boarding schools and just the impact this is having on all of our relatives and, and ourselves. Um, I also, you know, want to acknowledge the effort that's being raised by our United States Interior Secretary, Deb Holland. For once, we've got a cabinet member and um, the work she's doing with the federal government and um, launching the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative. Um, but given these recent findings and efforts, I feel it's important, and especially when coming from the field of child welfare, that you know we just take a moment to honor and reflect the thousands of indigenous children, both in the US and Canada, whose remains may finally be able to return home. So with that, I just wanna pause and, and honor them. And at this time, I'd like to call our own spirits to be with us. I am reminded by my elders to always call my spirit. Um, I notice that when I don't call my spirit, my ego wants to jump in and take over. And of course, that comes with anxiety and doubt and fear and judgment. So I just want to encourage us all to call our spirits, Gakadus Aki, and just look within ourselves to guide us and kind of walk through this content. Um, and just, you know, all of the work we do and the conversations we are having, 
it's just critical um, to have, to do, to keep moving forward in this work. So, you know, and as Indigenous people, you know, we know that the work we do is for our families, for our relatives. So in Dinawe Maganuk, it means my relatives, or in Dakota, Matakiawasan, all are related. So with that said, let's enjoy our time for the next hour and a half. And I thank you all again for being here and allowing me to just open this up and provide some, some words for you all and just, just share a little bit about um, where we are at. So with that, let's get started. And again, for those of you that feel comfortable, go ahead and put your name and where you come from. I see some of you have started that in the chat room and you know it's a nice way to connect with your peers. And I, and I see some are having trouble with video, so hopefully that can get resolved, um, but we'll all be patient um, trying to get this figured out. So why talk about self-care? Um, you know, honoring yourself enough to schedule time with yourself is the first step to well being. And I found that for myself, how important it is to take that time, whether it's in the morning to set my intention or pause during the day and reflect on and breathe, you know, and, and find that gratitude in order to really just calm myself. Um, and today we want you just to become more familiar with the healing and wellness resources. Many, of course, are located on our tribal information exchange. But we want you to recognize the need for and identify the wellness strategies and the mindful practices that we can do and how you can get them incorporated into your child welfare practice and just how to effectively incorporate those techniques for self-care, for mindfulness, or for team building into your practice. Um, so again, that's kind of what we are going to be talking about today. Um, and we will be working, of course, with Laura, who will help us to put links in the chat room so you guys um, have them and can upload them immediately. But as she mentioned, she'll also follow up with them in an email. So the next slide is, you know, we find ourselves, you know, talking about this and, you know, recognizing that here we are really being faced with it. Um, you know, it, during this pandemic. And, you know, I really want to validate the grief and the loss from this pandemic. You know, on this slide, we've got some um, recent um, statistics, some research that had come out and was released by pediatrics on COVID-19 and the loss of caregiver report. And of course, you know, looking at it, we see the disproportionality in native communities. In, in what our caregivers are facing. So I just want um, you know, to acknowledge again, the grief and the loss from this pandemic. I imagine that one of us um, has, not, has not been touched by what is happening. Um, and I also want to uh, ask a poll question. Um, and this one is just, have you learned any new self-care techniques since the pandemic? You guys are fast. So it looks like many are coming in both, yes and no. Good. So some of you have, 71%, it looks like, 72 are saying that you have learned some new self-care techniques since the pandemic. Good. Self-care in our Ho-Chunk language. Uh, I might want you to say that for us too, um, Nona. Nona was saying in the chat room that she, um, it, um, I don't even want, I don't even want to try to pronounce that. Um, I want to be respectful, um, but good. So, so, so many of you are, many, many of you have learned some new techniques um, during the pandemic. So that's, that's good. I'm glad um, because you know, with all of the atrocities that we have suffered, that we have endured, um, it's always important, you know, to, 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 you know, look at the lessons learned that we've gained from that, right? Um, so let's do that a little bit further. Um, and one of them, I know Nona, you just mentioned it, but the next slide talks about gratitude, right? Um, and I just, I want you guys to take a minute to write, you know, just to yourself, 
and write down three things that you are grateful for. Um, and I'm going to just pause. I'm going to do it myself. And three things that you are grateful for. And as you're doing that, as you're um, writing down three things that you're grateful for, and some of you might just bing, bang, boom, could write down 20 more. Some of you might be struggling and, and, and looking to find ways. But, and if you feel comfortable, go ahead and put them in the chat room. I, but that's your, that's your choice, whether you want to share those with others or not. And Nona already did. Again, I think that is um, finding gratitude in just our language. Um, I am learning more and more and more uh, how uh, the meaning in our, our languages and the answers that we have in our languages. So again, I appreciate that comment. Um, yep, Christy mentions her kids, her home, creator, life, family gift. Yep, thank you. Yes, just a gift of another day. Boy, now that I'm a grandma, I find that to be one of the things I am also grateful for is, you know, that I'm here. Um, now, I also want to share um, in in with you all is there's um, this article that was written um, by Barbara Fredrickson, uh, and it talks about the four ways to practice gratitude during COVID. Because I know, and again, I want to validate the, the grief and the loss and, and the hurts that have come out of this um, and, and never, ever take that hurt away because I know it's knocked some of us on our, on our feet. I mean, on our knees, we have been down with this grief. But I also appreciated this four ways to practice gratitude. Uh, Laura put a link in, in for you. And it's just kind of another takeaway. We won't jump into it um, today, um, but I think it really um, can help, you know, with our stress and with our fear and anxiety. Um, so I uh, thank you, Laura, for putting that in there. I'm going to take a breath. Here we go. And just slow down. I recognize sometimes when I get started, um, I just hit the ground running and I start talking really fast and I get, in, get real excited. So I just have to remind myself to take a breath and slow down, um, look at what's happening in the chat room. Um, so again, you know, what we want to talk about a little bit is, is the burnout, right? Um, and, uh, and I want to thank you again for doing this hard work. And I also want to recognize that, you know, we can't know joy if we don't know and experience sorrow, right? Um, and, you know, recognizing that the work we do and the secondary trauma um, happens. I think that witnessing traumatic events happening to others, especially when we see these families that we work with as our families, you know, can bring about even some compassion fatigue. Um, and that's just the impact of experiencing that secondary trauma, right? Um, and just want to talk about, you know, what burnout is and, um, and just, you know, being faced with feeling, you know, um, unable. Um, you know, burnout is, is, is not feeling like we can fulfill in a helping role due to, you know, this, this compassion fatigue. And we know that the stress of the work can have long-term outcomes if not adequately addressed or having the support that we need. Um, you know, we are going to discuss three topics and see how they relate to the work you do. Um, secondary trauma, of course, I mentioned that. Um, and, and this is something that, you know, when I was doing the direct services, um, I felt like, you know, it was really a, on a daily basis, um, very few days where I didn't have to um, um, experience, witness, 
guide, support um, some of the trauma that was happening. Um, and, you know, this exposure to repeated traumatic events experienced by youth and families that we work with, it, it just feels very real. It feels like our children, our families. Um, and even if you aren't the one experience it, you know, we know the weight. We know the weight of, of what our families are going through. Um, compassion fatigue, uh, it's just, you know, constantly being exposed to this and the emotional impact of experiencing that secondary trauma. Um, you just start to feel depleted or you question, you know, why did I get into child welfare? Um, why am I doing this work? Um, I, I know there were times, or people would say to me, how can you do that work, right? Um, so again, you know, if we are not addressing the burnout that we might be feeling or experiencing, um, you know, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, turn into deeper exhaustion. Um, you know, we're going to feel, um, you know, we're going to struggle even further with ourselves. So, um, you know, I'm just curious it, it, for in the chat room, it, it, you know, do you guys, are you familiar with the signs that you might be beginning to feel burnout? You know, what does that look like? Um, you know, what are the signs of burnout? And you can go ahead and put, if you feel comfortable again um, in the chat room, what, what does burnout look like to you? Um, and what are the signs? Oh, somebody just wrote sleepless nights. Ah, uh, yep. Yep. Kind of tossing and turning, thinking about our families, not being engaged with families. Yep. When we start to kind of disconnect, tired, poor sleep, low, low motivation. Yep. Yep, patience, that's a big one for me. Um, beginning to feel hopeless. Yeah, these are perfect. This is exactly the signs that we start to see, right? Yeah. So I wanna ask another poll question here. Um, can you tell me where is your wellness most impacted by burnout? So are you feeling it in your mind? Are you feeling it in your body? Are you feeling in your, your spirit or in your emotions? And I'm sure some of you probably want more than one because I think I could answer um, more than one. So a lot of you are saying um, the body, but Again, I also recognize that it's it's all of it, right? It's our mind, it's our body, it's our spirit, it's our emotions, and just some of the descriptions, you know, that you shared with us in the chat room really fall under all of that. Yeah, all of the above. Yep, I agree. So that's it's pretty even across, but a lot of you in the body. I remember when I first started doing meditation, um, I started to do a lot of um, body scanning. And just recognizing where things were landing in my body, whether it was my breathing, whether it was a tightness in my chest or a lump in my throat, um, and just recognizing that uh, it's, it's, it's there. Um, and, how, and how do we take care of ourselves? How do we slow ourselves down? Jackie, we yeah. have someone who had raised their hand. So I just wanted oh. to. Yeah. Can you, are they unmuted? Can you share? Jill, you should be able to unmute now if you'd like to share. And if not, um, uh, we are still here. Carol, you may as well. And just if you didn't intend to be unmuted, not a problem at all. But if folks do want to share anything verbally, there's a little raised hand icon, which would just let me know um, that you wanted to share something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Somebody commented, the mind leads to tired body, causing irritability, and, and lastly, your spirit. I couldn't agree more. Um, no worries. We just want to make sure that if, if you do want to speak, that you are absolutely welcome and invited. 
Um, so this next slide, you know, we found uh, we do some work with the with NICWI, and we recognized um, that they put together this burnout flyer, um, and that recognizing that child welfare workers experience burnout at a higher rate than any other helping profession. Um, and also further, because we talked about secondary trauma, right? But what we recognize is that 64% um, of burnout is work-related. So it has to do with the paperwork or the bureaucracy or the um, inability to feel like you're effectively making change. Um, so I think Laura was going to um, put a link to this. Um, so if you guys want to um, print it out um, or just keep it for yourself, because it also has, um, you know, what organizations can do. We'll talk more about this again, you know, as we move along in this conversation. But I really thought it was interesting to see that 36% is, you know, client related, um, but in 64 is, is, again, more about the, the, the work itself, the paperwork, the inability to affect change. So I felt that to be um, uh, fascinating. Uh, handout. And I think if, if we don't get the link in the chat room for you right now, we'll be sure to get all of these for you um, uh, in, a, in a response email when we're, when we're done. So hey, um, Jackie, I just wanted yeah. to add that to when I read this flyer, I really, to me, it, it talks, it speaks to the responsibility that the agency and the organization has to their workers to um, help reduce burnout and yep. to increase the, the well-being of their workers. Yeah, 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 I, I, I agree, Esther. It's not something that we should feel we have to do alone. Um, so Esther, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to you to kind of talk about some of the mindfulness uh, work and app. All right, thank you. So, the Tribal Information Exchange, which I'm hoping most of you have visited uh, already, we get to create a lot of wonderful products or gifts, as we like to call them sometimes. And one of the ones we created was this mindfulness app. And I know it sounds it sounds counterintuitive that there's an app on your computer on your phone that is supposed to help uh, with mindfulness, but it was really created. Um, specifically for workers involved in family assessments, but it, it's applicable to almost anyone. Anyone could find some use from this. So the, the app is, Laura knows the technical web-based app, I think is what it's called. So you, you access it through the web, either on your laptop or your tablet or your phone. <clears throat> so before we look at what's in there, I wanted to just talk about the importance of breathing. Um, we breathe all the time, whether we know it or not. And breath is the source of all life, right? And it's something we don't pay attention to. So mindfulness helps is one way to help us um, pay attention to our breath and paying attention to our breath is one way to be mindful. So it's like they're related. So a simple breathing exercise. So whenever you feel you can tell when you start to feel stressed out, what's the first thing you notice? Who notices their hands kind of get tight, right? Clenched and you, you're, you get tight around the chest sometimes and your breathing is up here, kind of shallow. You're breathing up here and not really taking a full breath. And we need that oxygen into our, our yeah. Some people hold their breath, right? Carol just put in the chat, you hold your breath that, um, you feel your muscles get tense, your, your blood pressure rises, your face might get flushed and it's hard to think, right? It's hard to respond. It's hard to um, be able to speak. So whenever you're in that, that situation or any situation, bring it back to the breath. Um, my friend, colleague, Maria Gerard, that's on this, she's in the audience right now. That, that's one thing I remember her saying, just bring it back to the breath and just remember your breath. And one thing that helps me, and you know, there's many different techniques and strategies and number games, 
but I like the four, four, eight. <laughs> it's on a count of four, you breathe in four, fill your lungs up, hold it for four, and then let it out for eight. So the most important thing that I've learned is it's the, the breathe in shorter than the breathe out. The breathe out should be longer and more controlled and slow. Many people will tell you it's best to breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. There are some breathing techniques that's all through your nose or all through your mouth, whatever is most comfortable for you. Personally, I've broken my nose so many times that it's difficult for me to breathe just through my nose. So I'm a mouth breather. I'll admit it. I think that's supposed to be a bad thing now, but so let's try that. Think about it for the count of four in, hold it for four, let it out for eight. And then repeat. And as you're, as you're doing the breathing, you, you, if you can think and visualize the refreshing energy, peacefulness in and out is all of the toxins and the negativity and whatever you need to let go, the anxiety or um, anything. I mean, even when we're, it's, there's good anxiety, right? Even when we're just like so excited that something good's gonna happen, we might need to calm ourselves down. So when we do that, once you start breathing like that, it helps lower your heart rate, your heart rate and reduce that, you know, that sweaty or that flush feeling we have. And it helps us calm ourselves enough to, for more critical thinking and, and a better response. A lot of times I have some experience of doing circles with uh, native inmates in the prisons and some of these techniques that I'm going to share with you, uh, we taught them and has helped them stay out of trouble in prison because when they feel triggered, when they feel like they're going to get upset and somebody's bothering them, I mean, the, there's a lot of triggers in prison. You need to have a thick skin to be there. They, they stop and they think about the breath or they'll do, um, you know, some EFT or they know their pressure points or these things that I'm going to show you. So always think about bringing it back to the breath. So if we go into the app, Laura, can you get into the app for us? I just wanted to show um, if you, oh. there she is. <clears throat> it's set up, we have a little talk about inter, uh, values a little bit and then all of the self-care tools are under resources. So I wanna just do one with you um, called relaxation responsive breathing. And this isn't something that you would do, you need some time and space to do this one. This is something you can do as part of your regular practice. And once you become practiced um, to it, you'll be able to, the word one, if you use it in this relaxation responsive breathing, eventually it will, you'll be able to access that same feeling by saying that word, eventually. <laughs> so in this practice, um, like it says there, the breath becomes an anchor. So you need to really get in a comfortable position somewhere that's quiet, not a lot of distractions, no uh, dogs barking in the back or people wanting your attention. Shut your cell phone off and just close your eyes. You can lie down or you can sit. Just close your eyes and then start to really relax your muscles. Think about your feet. Start at your feet and just consciously, you know, relax those feet, relax your chins up to your knees, keep them relaxed all the way up to the top of your head. Breathe through your nose for this one. Become aware of your breathing. And as you breathe out, say the word one silently to yourself. If it helps, you can say it out loud. So you breathe in, breathe out one. Breathe in, out one. And you wanna breathe easily and naturally, not, not counting, try not to count, just your natural rhythm of breathing. And they suggest to do this for 10, 15, 20 minutes um, and not to set an alarm, not to, um, to transition to awake so quickly, to lie there, sit or lie down for several minutes after 
and just slowly arouse, you know, slowly start to open your eyes and don't stand up immediately, not for a few minutes. So after <clears throat> with some practice, doing this maybe once a day or three times a week or whenever you need it, um, it it's said to be able, you'll be able to, like I said, elicit that relaxation response more easily and more quickly by using that that word one. You'll you'll um, you'll think about that word in relation. It'll remind you of this and like Pavlov, right? The dog and the bell and the um, hungry dogs. So that's one you can use. And I encourage you to go on to here and download this onto your um, phone. It's it's kind of old now. We created it several years ago. I'm sure if we created it now, there would be a lot more cool technological things on it, but it still has a, a lot of wonderful information. And we uh, have the resource, we have a list of where we got all the sources of all the, those techniques are on there. All right. So another resource that I want to bring your attention to is called, it's a wonderful website called uh, capacitar.org. Now this um, is another resource that my friend Maria showed me and it's an international organization and they are, like they said, their mission is healing ourselves and healing our world. And they have a wonderful emergency toolkit that's available in many languages. And if you download this toolkit, it looks like this, it's, it's a Word document, you can print it out. There are, it's called an emergency response toolkit and they use it, they'll, groups of people will go to a country that's having, that's uh, experienced some trauma, war, um, famine, natural disasters, and they'll come with these emergency toolkits and start working with people to help them um, try to, with their trauma, try to uh, mitigate their trauma. So in here, you'll see all kinds of exercises, a lot of body Tai Chi exercises, a lot of breath work exercises. And one that I really want us to talk about is called finger holds to manage emotions. And I really appreciate this one because I, I, um, adults can use it and it's wonderful to use with children. And once the technique is learned, you can do it without anybody knowing. It, it can be just your own thing that you need to do to get yourself through whatever. So the, the uh, philosophy or the origin around this is that our, in, in our bodies, we have all of these, uh, this energy, right? That way that, that goes through our bodies. And <clears throat> this finger holds helps by holding our fingers, our hands diff with these, uh, addressing these different emotions, it helps create this kind of feedback and we can, we can get a lot of relief from that. I have found for myself that it really helps with, um, uh, the anxiety and worry it when I'm having a hard time like when I worry about my children of course and worry always comes when three o'clock in the morning right it doesn't come in the daytime when you have a lot of access to a lot of uh, resources to help you get through it so it usually comes in the middle of the night and you know we all know up here we all know that it's probably they're probably all right most likely the kids are all right, but there's that little 1%, that worst case scenario, that nagging, right? That we, it's hard because we feel it in our body, just like the poll question you answered. Most people said they feel the burnout and the stress in their body. So this is a wonderful um, exercise. I use it, I'll just hold that finger. <clears throat> you hold each finger with the opposite hand for two to five minutes, as you can see on the screen. And it doesn't matter which hand you use and you just keep breathing in, um, acknowledging those, those feelings and trying to breathe them out slowly to let them go. And it's like all that anxiety is coming in and I'm breathing it out. And after a while you can feel, um, you'll have to try it. It's hard to describe, like you'll feel that sensation or that energy that that you're starting to um and it feels like you have more control over it almost i find it's really like i said really helpful with for children 
because it's something not only does the the act of doing this have a physiological benefit, but just that distraction of them having to remember how to do this sometimes can help them get through a, some trauma or some anxiety or fear. So I'll <clears throat> just leave you with that to, to, you know, take it, download this and take it home and, and start practicing some of these what I'll, I'll just talk about a couple more. The, there's one called the emotional freedom technique. And some of you might be, it's called tapping. Some of you might be familiar with this. So there are different points, acupressure points on our bodies here, here, down to here and under here. And this, this EFT technique um, is just a, that you'll see on that, um, on that thing I just showed you, the toolkit, how many times you need to tap here, tap here. And it's really helpful. It sounds, when I first saw somebody do it, I was like, what kind of weird stuff is that? But it's it's very, it's very helpful. So there's a, a sequence of taps you do, different points of your body as you go um, through this practice. And you do it depending on what level of anxiety you have, but you can read about it. I won't keep you to, you know, I could, I'm like so excited about these. I love doing these. So that's why I'm all animated. But <clears throat> the last one I want to draw your attention to is acupressure for pain and traumatic stress. So some of these are for emergency situations. So if somebody is at the point that they are going to faint or their blood pressure is really skyrocketing and they're in, you know, crisis, you know how some people, they feel like they're losing their mind, which I don't believe is possible, but there's a pressure point right here that and you take your index finger or your knuckle of that finger and you press into that point directly below your nose and on your lip. You can do it to somebody else too, if somebody's on the verge of fainting and it it's supposed to really help them. Um, another couple other, another point for anxiety and crisis and overwhelm is this, uh, point on the indentation outside of your wrist here, right here. That's another pressure point for anxiety. And then on the top of your shoulders. So just think, you know, just pressure, pressure. And like I said, not only are they, is it physiologically helping, but just the act of remembering how to do something helps you stay present sometimes, which is sometimes makes all the difference is to stay present. Then there are also holds that you can do to yourself on your head and you can do to other people. So I really encourage you to check this out there. These techniques are ancient techniques from all over the world, from indigenous people all over the world. All right. I don't even know. I'm not looking at my time. You'll have to tell me if I'm talking too much. No, we're doing great. All right. So next slide, Laura. Everybody's favorite thing or not so favorite thing. And I know this is why you all signed up, right? Because you wanted to know about the icebreakers and the warm-ups and the team builders, right? <laughs> Jackie's for, for, forcing a smile. <laughs> uh -huh. So <clears throat> Zoom has really changed. I mean, if you thought icebreakers and warm-ups and team builders were hard before Zoom, I think that they're a little, we have more difficulty doing them now. So we have to get more innovative. And Zoom has really changed how we engage with each other. It's made things a lot more accessible for some people. I have um, come to see that there are a lot of people that couldn't get out of their homes because of physical disability or emotional disability or you know issues that they had are able to to engage um <clears throat> engage more so that's been a blessing for some people and it has think it has also made things too accessible which kind of feels like a curse because people are in our homes now uh people see our family life people um, it, it's just more of an intimate space even though it's disconnected through the computer it's kind of a paradox. So Zoom fatigue is real. And I'm sure I don't have to tell any, any of you that have spent any time on Zoom. It's hard on our minds and it's hard on our bodies. We'll share some resources in the chat for some wonderful um, things that are just directly related to Zoom that you can read. 
some of the tips in the research I've done, the top tips that I can share with you, and I agree with them because I use them too. Number one, when you're on Zoom, hide your self view. And you can do that by going in the box where your picture is, those three dots, and you can click hide self view <clears throat> because it's, it's really taxing on the brain to be having a conversation with somebody and seeing your image at the same time. Your brain has to do so much more processing. That's why it makes us so tired. I mean, check in the beginning to make sure you look okay, but then hide your self view. <laughs> um, the other one is to use the speaker view. So if you go up on top and you see that little box with the squares, it says view way on the top of your screen. If you do um, speaker, then you'll see the person who's speaking. If you do gallery, you'll see everybody. And it's it's harder for your brain to see all these people and trying to pick out which one is speaking because you're looking at them and you kind of see everybody else in your periphery. So it's easier on your brain if you're looking at one person that's talking. Another tip that I, I don't know where I picked it up, but I Googled it and it's out there on the internet. And I remember it because it's 202020. So every 20 minutes that you're on the screen, even if it's your phone or the TV, any screen, <clears throat> for every 20 minutes, you look at something 20 feet away for 20 seconds. And that is for eye strain. It will really help your eye strain. So I have to figure out what 20 feet away is, but 20 feet away for 20 seconds. And then you go back. And some people even have a little of course, they have an app to remind you, right, to do that every 20 minutes. So are there any, as we're going along, please feel free to share whatever tips you have learned. Um, put them in the chat so everyone else can learn from them too. So those are just some technical Zoom kind of tips. Now, icebreakers, warm-ups, team builders. Why are they so important and why, uh, what purposes do they serve and how they, can they appeal to different learning styles and when is the best time to use them? So that's the things we're going to talk about. I'd like to do a poll if, if we can, Laura. I know um, I just really want to know where everybody stands on icebreakers, these, these wonderful team building activities. I was, we were just going to do, I love them and I don't like them, but I thought, you know, there might be some people that don't have any strong feelings one way or the other. Oh, good. We got 40. Right on. Hey, it's pretty, pretty close, huh? We don't have too many people that dislike them too much. So we can see who the introverts and extroverts are. <laughs> it really depends on the activity. Yeah, the safety and the, that is wonderful, Meg. That is number one, safety. Um, okay, we're all done. So for for new teams, like, and and I'm not, I'm talking about all of this within. Most of what I'm going to talk about is online, virtual, and some of these things we can be you can be applicable to to in person but for new remote teams doing something silly and like not heady and um we say no pressure but if you don't if you're in the 19 uh, percent here that load them it still feels pressure i know um but doing something silly at the beginning of a meeting can help get team members feeling more comfortable sharing their ideas it is intended to um, create safety, but you also need safety to get people to participate. So it's kind of it's kind of like a a cycle, a, a cyclical relationship, causal relationship. So if and if you know icebreakers and being silly are good for seasoned teams, people who are have been working together for a long time, because it can really rejuvenate team spirit and then strengthen bonds between team members things that show how we're connected and how we're um, things that we have in common are always wonderful. My favorite one that it's in person though is called a uh, big wind blows. And we have a, a, an, a, a link, we can share a link to how to play that game. And that's something you can do in person. <laughs> that's really fun. Cause what it does is it shows how you're connected. You say, you know, everybody, 
everyone that is you stand up and say um everyone who loves um coffee has to stand up so you'll know who loves coffee everybody has to go find a place to sit so that's online um, that's in person but virtual icebreakers can help relax and set the set attendees at a meeting at ease as well because if we speed up the process of getting to know each other the more we get to know each other the more productive we are and the better work better quality work we really have to when you're thinking about icebreakers have to respect all learning and engagement styles some people will will only talk in small groups some people don't like small groups they they would rather put something in the chat some people would rather have a poll question um some for you know people learn differently and my rule is to never force anybody to do anything always let people have the option of passing i mean even when we're in ceremony and circle right we don't force anybody everybody has an option whether or not they want to pass <clears throat> um and we know that being on zoom we it, we do feel more isolated. So these games and these, because if we were in person and we got together for a meeting, we'd probably spend, and <clears throat> I dare say that I think that this is cultural. I think Native people would probably spend 10, 15 minutes chit-chatting and catching up and talking to each other and laughing and joking around before the, any meeting gets done. So I think in the virtual world, we need to really, we need to make room for that too, because that relationship building and that connection is something that we need to keep fostering to help us um, be better at what we do and be better for each other. And it's part of self-care. That community care is also self-care, getting care from each other and how we are in relation to each other. So <clears throat> here's a tip, <clears throat> and we can do it now if you'd like. Everyone can change, let's all change our name. If you go to your, your window, right, your, where your picture is, and you put rename, let's all change our name to three dots, one, two, three. So this way, if you're in a team, especially where you have, if you have mixed uh, people and different authority levels, supervisors and workers, and you wanna talk about things and you wanna create safety, if everybody's anonymous, then nobody knows who's writing what in the chat. She can't see her picture. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Carol. Um, so that's one technique to use. That, that's one tactic you can use to, to ensure that everybody's anonymous and it creates that safety that somebody talked about. Oh, you don't have your screens. I'm sorry. Folks should see the participant list. So it's actually on your name in the participant list. Maybe I misspoke. I, maybe we can't do this on webinar, huh? Zoom webinar is slightly different than Zoom meeting. Okay, so if this was Zoom meeting and not Zoom webinar, you could you could have attendees change their name so that everybody is anonymous. And you can see Jackie and I mean Laura and I did it. Can you see our names now? We just got three dots. So if I wrote something in the chat right now, tell me what if you can tell who wrote it. Yeah, it's got my picture. All right, just forget all that. Sorry. <laughs> I was in a meeting and it worked and it was wonderful because nobody knew who was putting what in the chat. Okay, so do you want to play a game? Everybody's like, no. No, I... What kind of game? Yeah, okay, so I learned this. We... Why don't Jackie and Laura and I, why don't we do it to demonstrate? Because I don't think everybody's going to be able to play it because we're not on Zoom meeting, we're on Zoom webinar. So this game is called, we played it the other day. <laughs> oh no. Just for the it's record, called, I would be the one to respond that I loathe icebreakers. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Read My Lips. Oh. Okay, I'm so going to stop sharing the screen so people see your videos yes. bigger. Yes. Stop sharing the screen. So what we, I just learned this the other day. I've only played it once. So what we did was you can, you can do it anyway, but for, for the sake of explaining it, we'll, we'll pick a topic. My favorite ice cream. You, you, you have to say what your favorite ice cream is. So you go on to mute 
and you say your favorite ice cream and everybody has to guess it. And it gets pretty funny if there's a lot of people, okay. Uh, Rocky Mountain. So if you if you think you know what Esther said, you could put it in the chat. There's a lot of rocky roads coming in. So it can be pretty funny. Mm -hmm. And and when we did it, the other introvert in the room thought it wasn't that bad. <laughs> I don't know what you thought, Laura. But no, Adrian I liked it. it wasn't that bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that. that's one you can do to kind of to get people loosened up and laughing. Another one we did at a retreat we had recently was <clears throat> we drew each other's pictures. So we we each got paired up and you, we did it in the gallery view so everybody could see everybody and say I would be paired with Jackie. And so we have 30 seconds. I have 30 seconds to draw Jackie without looking at what I'm writing. And I'm just looking at her and I'm drawing and then we show each other our pictures and people really enjoyed that one too. So those are two that you can do. Um, and we'll, we shared, I think we shared, did we put in the chat, Laura, some of the uh, resources for some of these virtual icebreakers? Yes. I want somebody to guess what, I, what ice cream I want. Oh, I'm, I'm, so I'm still thinking about ice cream. Go ahead, okay. Chocolate monkey? <laughs> Somebody got it right. Chunky monkey. <laughs> Chunky monkey. <laughs> Yay. Others I like know. ice cream. <laughs> That's a fun one. Thanks, Esther. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, the sillier we, as adults, we have um, been socialized to, to forget how to play. And I really believe that we, deep down, we all like to play. That's why when a, a two-year-old, I saw that meme, if a two-year-old hands you a toy phone, what do you do? You start talking, right? Because we all like to play. <laughs> so the more fun you can have, um, say fun and not at the expense of anybody and respecting that some people really cannot participate in things and, and for that to be okay that will create the space to hopefully um, at least make them feel good enough and safe enough to participate in the meeting. And um, do we have it? I just wanted to say one more thing if we have some time. Do we have time or should I, do we need to move on? We do. And I just wanted to just do a shout out for Sandra. If you wanted to unmute, you should be able to now. Sorry, that was an accident. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so <clears throat> one thing that I just wanted to mention real briefly is to talk a little bit about land acknowledgements as a way to create that safety for people and as a way to educate other people about showing gratitude and uh, appreciation for the land. Some some folks have done asking people to put it in the chat where they're from and who the, the indigenous people of that territory are. There's a website you can direct people to that you put in where you live and, and it's a database that'll show you who those indigenous people are. And just, just to keep in mind that that's one way to set the tone of, of any time you're coming together. And <clears throat> to create that safety. And also it, you know, it helps, it helps uh, all of us to learn the truth about the land. So I think that's, that's Good stuff. all I had. Good stuff. I love it. And I love that we had time to, to demonstrate them. So thank you. Um, you know, the, the, so we have uh, more slides for you and we recognize that some of you may have only booked this to the top of the hour. So we definitely will be sending out a recording, but we want to just kind of walk through ways in which you can incorporate this into your work. Um, and, you know, that's where we're going to spend a few more, a little bit more time. And I really appreciate somebody in the chat room um, mentioned about, you know, ending your Zoom meetings or your calls early. 
allowing people that space in between their calls. And so there's no harm in being able to end early. So uh, that we might do. I appreciate that, that advice, that suggestion. So the next slide is just talking about, you know, working in balance. Um, and, you know, we, we, we recognize that self-care is a core component, you know, to addressing burnout. It's a core component to improving our resilience, although I'm using that word less and less. But um, when we think of ourselves, there are five main components that make up ourselves, right? We've got the psychological self. Um, what do we love to learn about? How do you love to learn? What stimulates our thinking and problem solving, right? So the psychological self, we have that emotional self. Are you in tune with your emotions and your feelings? Do you take time to acknowledge those feelings? Um, do you express those feelings? And what happens uh, when you experience the intense feelings um, and in and, and having that emotional uh, intelligence? Um, of course, there's the physical self. How do we nourish our bodies? How do we provide movement to our bodies? Um, and just recognizing when many say, you know, they can feel it in their bodies, like how, how, do, we, how do we acknowledge our bodies? How do we take care of the, the feelings that come up in our bodies? You know, are we resting? Are we moving? Um, what do you do if you're sick or you're injured to get better? Um, the relational self, uh, who are the people? And this is very important, I think, to us as indigenous people is like, who are the people we connect with? Who, who's important to us? Um, and how do, you, how do you spend time with those people? And, and how do you seek them for help? Um, and, and what happens when you might not agree with um, some of those folks? And then of course, our spiritual selves, um, where we hold our, our values and our beliefs and, and recognizing my connection to something greater um, than myself. And this does not have to be connected to a religious affiliation either. It's just rather your own interpretation of how personal and how sacred uh, this can be. And, it, and again, it doesn't mean you have to share with others. It's just how do you hold space for that sacredness? So I just wanted to share, um, you know, how, how we do this work in balance of all of that. The next slide is just how do you nurture and take care of your own spirit? Um, and if some of you feel comfortable, you know, feel free to, to share that in the chat room. And I also, you know, we've been doing these healing webinars. Um, in fact, we did one with Rick and Ethleen, uh, two dogs from South Dakota and Elsie Boudreau. Um, and, in, in that, when we, when we talked about healing and we talked about wellness and we talked about our, our ceremonies, um, we also recognize that many of us, um, that that is very sacred, that it, that is very personal. And so, you know, of course, I always want to, to let folks know that, you know, this is something you can share if you choose to. Um, some people share it all. I mean, we've got selfies on Facebooks doing all kinds of things, um, you know, smudging. <laughs> some people don't have problem sharing and some people would rather not. They'd rather keep that kind of to themselves. Um, somebody put going into the woods. Oh, yes. And listen, um, the smell. Yes. I think anytime we're out in the woods, in the wilderness, you know, it's like all of our senses are, are being tapped into. We're watching you know, as we walk, we're listening for the sounds, you know, of animals. Um, we're smelling, like you're saying, like that earth smell, um, the trees, you know. Um, and then, you know, of course, you know, for those of us that have rivers or lakes, you know, we're able to kind of drink some of that. So I definitely feel that's a beautiful way uh, to take care of our, of our spirits. Um, songs and stories. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so good. That's um, always something to keep in mind is kind of what nurtures our spirits and how do we take and make space for that? You know, Jackie, I think it's even even the notion that we have that spirit is 
something that I don't think many people think about a lot. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like my spirit is something I have to take care of and something I, you know, it's, it's alive, you know, it, it it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I love, I love that perspective. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, I have, and, and again, I have respect for, you know, the attendees here and, and recognizing again, that this is very sacred. It's very personal and it's not something I typically talk much about, but, you know, the ceremonies that we go to, um, you know, uh, our lodges, our songs. I mean, I hear those songs, um, you know, as we're singing them in the summer, you know, in the plains um, and, and just kind of bring myself back to that place. And if I hear those Sundance songs when I'm not in that ceremony, it still does the same thing. It wakes up my spirit. It nurtures my spirit and it lets me know that I'm going to be okay. Um, laughter, somebody mentioned. I absolutely, and I love the strong woman song. Um, absolutely. I think as Indigenous people, we are so, so, so blessed to have all of um, the ceremonies and the songs. Um, you know, some people talk about sewing. Um, you know, we, we have so many blessings and, and traditions and values that um, I feel extremely grateful for. So I wanna just talk about, you know, what are some of the ways you connect to your culture? I, you know, some of what you, you guys have mentioned that um, you talked about sewing, you talked about praying and smudging, and you talked about gathering. Um, I know the next slide, we have a, a poll question for you as to whether or not, you know, you incorporate these, your medicines, your practices, your traditions into the work with your families. Do you feel like that has been a line that's been drawn? Or do you feel like you can incorporate those, your, your practices into the work you do with your families? Um, and I think, I think we created a chat, uh, a poll question um, in, for you on that. And, and maybe, I'm not sure, Laura, if we have one. Yes, she did. Of course she did. Do you incorporate your medicine and your rituals, your, your practices into your work with your families? Or is that something that just belongs to oh, yourself? Huh? You ever go that way? You still need to go to transportation too, don't you? Yeah. Oh, I can hear somebody. <laughs> Um, so some of you, kind of half and half, a little bit more are saying yes, you are able to incorporate your medicine, your practices, your traditions. Um, when I worked for a Dakota tribe, um, we had the, the ability to bring um, some of our families into, into sweat, into lodge, and I felt like that was probably one of the best and greatest gifts we could have given our families who were struggling is to make those ceremonies available to them. So it's pretty half and half here. 57% said yes, um, that, you, that you have been able to do that. And I don't know if you want to share in the chat uh, that has worked uh, in being able to do that um, or any challenges. And if you don't feel comfortable, uh, that, is, that is okay. I know when I worked in the non- outside of a tribe, I worked with a tribe, I had more ability to do like the drumming and the singing and the ceremonies. Um, but I know when I worked for um, a non-native organization, that was a little bit trickier. You know, it was getting permission to, to be able to be out late if the sweat was running late or who's gonna transport or, you know, there was a little bit more challenges. So for those of you that have been able to, um, that's, that's wonderful. I know our families truly and deeply respond to that. Uh, oh yeah, peacemaking volunteer in the community. Language intertwined in daily living, sharing a meal, drum, drum making. So those are beautiful ways. Ribbon skirts. Um, uh, yes. And I'm wondering too, um, uh, Laura just put in the chat uh, a resource from our organization that I volunteer with, Wabanaki Reach. It's a uh, like the top top self soothing techniques and tools. Uh, if you want to download that and print it, you can. Good. I'm I'm interested to know the the folks, the forty three percent that um, do not incorporate medicine and rituals. If if they're 
if there are any challenges that you might want to share that we, you can get some support for, around or if it's something that just can't happen. Mm -hmm. If you want to share your medicine and rituals and, and you have some challenges, maybe you could get some support here from some of the other folks and mm -hmm. feel free to just send, send a private chat too if you don't want to chat publicly. Dish bags to take to community meals. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, so so our rituals and our ways of knowing and being are um, how we treat each other, right? And how we take care of each other. Hmm. And, and that, that community care, as well as self-care, is so important, too. Mm -hmm. And you'll see on that the brochure that Laura put in the chat, doing something nice for others and being kind to somebody else is a form of self-care as well. And we always have to keep it balanced though. So we don't give too much. You can't pour from an empty cup, but it, it does fill our cups up to give. So we need to have that balance. Or reciprocity is so important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And kind of talking a little bit more about that community connection and healing. Um, and just some of you have already described ways in which, but what was the last thing um, you did where you felt connected and you felt engaged with others? And I know that the pandemic has limited us in person. I know that we have become more creative um, during this pandemic on gathering, especially, I can only speak, I'm an Indigenous woman, so most of my engagement is with other Indigenous people, family, friends, community organizations. Um, and I have really come to appreciate, you know, how we have gathered during this pandemic, even if it's been, um, you know, uh, safely with masks and distance, or whether it's um, Zoom, uh, uh, Zoom, Zoom webinars that are happening. But what was the last thing you did where you felt connected and engaged with others? Oh, somebody said just today, um, putting together bags of toys. Yeah, here we are close to the holidays for our kids for toys, toys for tots. Yep. Yeah. And, and I know it feels good that we can now do this again, because um, I know last year we were very limited. Um, and again, you know, I know that there is anxiety even being able to do it this year and, you know, with this new variant and, you um, you know, some of the fears that go along with that. Uh, and how do we, how do we take care of ourselves? And how do we, you know, uh, set those set those uh, boundaries, if, you know, if we're able to with not doing them, because some of us, you know, might have a, a, a low, uh, you know, a less, uh, how do you say it, um, immune compromised, right? Um, and it's still risky for them to be engaging in their communities or are going out and doing things. Um, and so how do we recognize and honor those that, that can or cannot? Um, but yeah, it sure feels good when we are able to do that. There, there was, I'll just share this one um, strategy. There's organization in our tribal communities delivered four colored pieces of cardboard to the elders and, and twice a day they go around and the elder will put the, the card in the window and each color means something different. Red means I need something, um, you know, one color could be, I, I just need a phone call or I'm all set. So they put them in the window and it, it's kind of that connection for them to know that they're communicating with people. And so that I thought that was pretty neat. One, one thing that they thought of innovative. Yeah. That's a great, great idea. Um, some, somebody talked about gathering outside late fall with a number of tribal members. It was so good to see, talk, and just be together. 100%, 100%. I went to American Indian Chamber of Commerce dinner last Friday, and it, I, it, people I hadn't seen for a while. Um, we definitely know how to make relatives, don't we? So I want to talk a little bit just about the self-care in the workplace and, and how do we foster that? Um, how do we create space in 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 an atmosphere like how how agencies can really
think about using the techniques that Esther walked through with us uh, in their teams and how these organizations can really, I mean, given the number of, you know, what we saw with the NICWI slide, you know, knowing that a large percentage is really about the work, you know, how can we make organizations um, take self-care um, and make it just a regular part of their structure? You know, how do we do that? And I guess I'm curious, are, are there spaces you can go to decompress and, and take care of yourself at your agency that you work with or you work for? And again, you know, the beauty of working for a tribe, I could smudge right in my office, right at my desk. But when I worked for a state agency, I was not able to do that. Um, so I recognize that some people can and some people cannot. Are there spaces you can go to decompress and take care of yourself at your agency? So about 60% said yes, and 40% um, indicate they, they do not have that space. Um, it, you know, and when people realize how easy it can be and the difference in, in incorporating that, um, you know, I think it, it, you know, even just five minutes of silence, you know, that can make, you know, or, or focus on, you know, just taking care of oneself, especially when we see some of our managers or our supervisors or our leadership doing it, you know, just even five minutes of silence. Um, shutting our doors, not answering our phones, removing um, all of that can really um, have a significant impact on our well being. And again, you know, referring back to the NICWI, um, that, that burnout um, resource that they created, they really talk about some ways in which you can, you can bring this into your work environment. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but I know. There were some identified. Do you have that in front of you, um, Esther? Some of the other experiences besides like the five minutes of silence that they indicate on that flyer? On the NICWI flyer? Yeah. Yeah, um, <clears throat> to address burnout, they talk about managing your workloads. Yeah. And build supportive organizational climate. So the things you were talking about, you know, the safe, use safety and self-care plans, even for staff, trauma-informed lens uh, to support the workforce, peer relationships, peer relationships supports for secondary yeah. trauma. Yeah, yeah, having somebody so, to talk with. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because I think about, you know, a day in the life of a child welfare worker, and I think about, you know, what my day was like, and when I would get up and I would start, you know, working. Um, and, you know, one of the things that impressed me, and I don't know if I should even name the tribe, but I was doing some national consulting and I had the, the blessing of working with them for six some years. So I was able to travel and work with this tribe frequently and it was out East. And they, every single morning would come together and they um, would read some daily affirmations. And they would just sit there and read, I think it was from two or three books. And it really, I, it, what I was able to witness is just the slowing down. Because so many times we open up our mail, we start answering our messages, and we just go to, go to work. But to watch them come in and, and just practice that slowing down and that self-care, and then doing it together. Um, in, in reading those affirmations and how it applied to them and, and, and kind of setting that intention uh, for them throughout their day. Uh, so I just really wanted to, um, you know, think about like, what are some of those ways we can, and I'm just curious for those of you here, like, do you think you can find some ways, and I think this is a poll question, not a chat room. Do you think you can find some ways to incorporate some of the tools here that we talked about. And I think this is just a yes or no, or no, it's not. It's very likely, likely. Ooh, Laura's got all of the choices here. So how I likely want... are you to use some of the self-care tools you learned about today? I wanted to just mention one thing, Jackie, you, you talked yeah. about sitting in silence mm -hmm. and how um, 
historically, you know, many of our tribal nations used silence as a way to come together, to mm -hmm. be one, uh, to be present and to arrive with each other. And mm -hmm. what I've learned from um, working with the folks at the National Trauma Center for Children is that some, I've learned that anything can be a trigger trauma, but in particular, sitting in silence sometimes is really hard for people. So it can be a wonderful technique, but it also needs to be done with care, mm -hmm. um, de you know, depending on who it's with. But it, especially when things are coming at a, to heads or, or people are, are frustrated with each other and the communication is breaking down, sometimes it's, it's a good practice to just, everybody just sit and be mm -hmm. quiet for a few minutes and reset. But mm -hmm. I just wanted to mention that. So given the yes, no, um, you know, I'm just curious about, um, and, and, you know, half of you said you're likely or, or very likely, um, but what are things your agency does, I guess, that's what I'm curious about out there, is what are, what, what are things your agency does to promote wellness in, in the workplace? Like, what do you guys do intentionally? I, I think it has to be with intention, right? Yeah, somebody um, talked about just making time. One way that I think <clears throat> agencies can support workers is, is the leeway or the time and flexibility to respond to your family when your family needs you. You know, family comes first, I think is has helped me the the place that I work knowing that if my children need me and I need to take some time off to take care of my kids I can do that and mm -hmm. it's not I don't get I don't it's what I the response I get from my colleagues is don't even worry about us you know we'll yeah. figure it out you need to take care of yourself yeah. and it might not be a, an official policy but it's just the the way that we work and that to me means a lot yeah yeah Oh, and I really want to encourage folks, yeah, take a look at what folks are writing in the chat room, um, because I think that's the other thing is we can, you know, really learn from one another and, and, and keep pushing forward ways, you know, that we can take care of ourselves. Self-care lunch, lunch and learns on WebEx. Um, yeah. Mandatory I, mental health days. That's wonderful. Yep. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Because I don't think when I was doing the direct services years and years ago, none of this, I don't, I don't think we were able to do any of this. And in fact, we were putting in and it was a pretty strong burnout. Um, yes, good. Staying virtually connected. Yeah. I mean, especially when it's on our terms, right? Um, so good. Well, and looking at the time too, and I just want to be um, respectful. Some of these next slides was really just a matter of showing you, um, you know, when we've done this work in the past, some quotes that came out of that outreach um, and, and, you know, what we heard from folks in Indian country. And it's really not far from what we've seen and heard from you guys um, in the chat room. So, you know, we've talked about you know, music, so our songs being medicine and healing. We've talked about restoring and, and maintaining that balance. Um, you know, we talked about language and what that means um, when, when, we, when, we, when we pull it apart, when we're hearing our traditional languages um, spoken um, and healing, how healing occurs when we love our authentic self. Um, so that's just some of the examples of um, what we have been told and what we have learned over the years of doing this. Um, you know, another one was a, a quote, um, my healing is my heartbeats. And so some of you mentioned your children and having gratitude. They have shown me a path to connect to the source and all of that entails ceremony, joy, tears, love, kindness, my motivation to heal all aspects of myself right down to the cellular level. And that quote was by actually my sister, um, Cindy Day Ryder, and those are her boys. Um, 
So good. Well, I want to just make sure that before we you, we disconnect that, you know, I uh, let you know that all of our CBCT resources that we've talked about, we have, you know, the uh, self-care where you can find them. And that is on the Tribal Information Exchange. Um, so if you go in there, you'll see the drop down menu. It can bring you right to um, healing and wellness. Take a look at that. That is where a lot of these resources are located. Um, and want to just make sure that you have that. Um, it, um, again, it's on the healing and wellness page. We've got trauma resources from the National Children's Trauma Center, which is a partner. But I also want to quickly mention that we have a self-care peer group. And I think that's the next slide. Um, and that's coming up. The self-care peer group is coming up on January 5th. An announcement just went out, um, and but I, I want to help them out with this peer group. So I want to ask you guys, um, it, she talked about launching this peer group for tribal child welfare professionals. And if you were to participate, what would be the most um, beneficial to you? What, what is most beneficial to you? What, is it really just about connecting with your peers, um, about the challenges of the work? Uh, would it be participating, or excuse me, practicing self-care techniques? Um, is it hearing different resources and tools like we did today? Is it learning what other programs are doing? So go ahead and help us out um, because we wanna make sure that when that peer group starts in January, you know, that they're really kind of honoring and recognizing what you guys need, um, you know, when coming together. And so many of you, it is um, that you guys are at, connecting with peers about the challenges of work and learning what other programs are doing. Yeah. Good. Good. And I want to make sure and, and give that information to um, the National Native Children's Trauma Center are the ones who will be uh, facilitating uh, that peer group. And if you haven't received anything, you can let us know. We can make sure and get you an invitation for that peer group. So, um, you know, in closing, uh, Esther had this beautiful, um, this beautiful poem that we are free to be who we are, to create our own life out of the past and out of the present. We are our ancestors. When we can heal ourselves, we also heal our ancestors, our godmothers, our godfathers, and our children. When we heal ourselves, we heal Mother Earth. And that was from Dr. Rita Pita Blumenstein. And so I appreciate that. Um, Esther's always, Esther Boudreau has always shared that with me. Um, so Elsie, do you want to just, or I mean, Elsie. Me, I, I get Elsie <laughs> and Esther. So I want to just turn this over to, to Esther to, to close us out. Yeah, that was Elsie's, Elsie's poem. Elsie, and <laughs> Elsie Boudreau, yes. So I wanted to just take in close and take us through this quick guided meditation um, from Wabanaki Reach, the organization I uh, volunteer with. <clears throat> I invite you to please sit comfortably in your chair, your back nice and straight. Place your hands comfortably in your lap and plant your feet squarely on the floor. Take a deep breath in and let it out with a sigh. Now I invite you to close your eyes or to simply lower and soften your gaze. Become aware of your environment, what's around you, the light coming through your eyelids, the sounds, the smells, the sense of space, the air touching your skin. Acknowledge where you are. You are here now. Now let's turn our awareness inward to our bodies. Become aware of the back of your thighs resting comfortably on the seat of your chair. Feel the chair against your muscles and know you are supported. Be aware of the breath in your abdomen and become aware of the gentle rise and fall of your stomach. Take one big cleansing breath in and release it with a sigh. Letting go of any tensions in your body. They are free to leave. Smile as you breathe because you are here right now. Now become aware of your feet. 
Bring your thoughts into your feet. Notice your feet and feel how you are supported by the floor beneath your feet. Bring your attention to that floor. Imagine how it stretches out around you to touch the walls of the building and how those walls extend downward into the ground. The firm foundation resting deeply in the rich soils of Mother Earth. Imagine the earth underneath your building, how it feels, how it smells. Breathe in knowing you are supported upon this earth. Breathe out knowing you are connected to the earth, to all creation and to all humanity. You are connected to your ancestors. We are connected to each other and connected to future generations. When you feel ready, you can open your eyes and join us with a smile and feeling refreshed. Thank you, Esther. And may you all have ease in the rest of your day. Uh, evaluations will be coming, a follow-up with the resources. So take care, everybody.